So share with somebody. That, that, that's not the crux of the message today, but we're, we're in the same vein. That sacrifice creates the atmosphere of miracles. Amen? Amen. Um, let, let's jump into the word. Um, if you can, help me with Deuteronomy 28, 23, please. Some of y'all jumping ahead over there. And the Bible says that, and thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. Right, right. This is speaking to the access that one would have to, to the heavens and how it can sometimes feel like it's being shut up. It's like you're, you're hitting brass. And, and, and what's being talked about here is actually a result of a curse that came out of disobedience of a people. But how many know that we're not that people? That we're a people of obedience. We're a people of prayer. We're a people of sacrifice. But why I'm sharing this with you is that the atmosphere of miracles can be created whenever there is this lack. So if you find yourself in an environment that has famine, infertility, any kind of lack, I, I want you to know and be confident that all it requires is a level of sacrifice. It requires a level of prayer and obedience. And, and, and that has the ability to shift the whole atmosphere on its head. So, like, it's hard when you're dealing with an atmosphere that's brass up here and iron down here. Where your prayers are not getting up. And, and this earth around you is not being fruitful. You can't grow stuff on iron. But how many know that you can change this atmosphere by sacrificing and creating one that is rich of miracles? But it's going to take sacrifice. It, it, it's going to take time like we have spent over the, the, the previous 21 days in the beginning of the year where, 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 where our hearts start to cry out, not my will. But your will. And all of a sudden things start to shift. And there starts to be cracks up here that give access. And not just access, but there becomes this love and there becomes this solution. There becomes this answer. And there becomes this miracle that changes the whole dynamic of what was once iron. Now it becomes fruitful in your life. Now it becomes productive in your life. Like th this is the atmosphere that we can create. Are you with me? So, be, Jesus gave that ultimate sacrifice, right? right like, I, I, don't, I don't have to just tell you, but I am here to refresh and remind you that Jesus was that ultimate sacrifice. And that it's because of his obedience to the cross that we have the ability to create this atmosphere. That, that now we, we, don't, we don't bang against a brass ceiling, but we have access to the living God. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure we're grasping how powerful that is. Until you encounter a season of your life where it feels like there is nothing getting through, you recognize the, the strength of what Jesus did for us on the cross and giving us access to a heavenly father that desires to give us good things. But But... We have access to a miracle-working God is what I'm trying to say. But here's the thing is if you stick with God long enough, it's just going to become a norm to you. But here's the powerful thing about a normal life of miracles and signs and wonders with God is that they'll always just blow your mind. I make it sound too simple in saying just walking with God, you're going to experience miracles. But there are things that are suddenly with God. That while you think you know what it's going to look like, he does something even greater. You, you, we're only still seeing through this blurred optic when it comes down to the miracles of God. Our mind can only comprehend so much, but until Jesus makes it our reality. Amen? Stick with God. You stick with God long enough. And you're going to experience that. That's going to just be your norm because that's the God that we walk with. So, so miracles are just, they're, they're just the default. They're, miracles are, are accompany salvation, right? 
But Jesus is our salvation. He, he alone is the miracle. Are you with me? He's alone the miracle. It, you, you know, when I, when, I was th- when I was thinking about sacrifice, that's a challenging one because the vast majority of sacrifice that we see is, is actually represented in the Old Testament. And how many know that just about every sacrifice that is made, something dies? You recognize that? That the, the, the only sacrifice that has been made that changed the whole world was Jesus. And while he died, he resurrected. So that as we die, we can resurrect. Is the very core of us being born again. I mean, you, you have to die. But, but the interesting thing is that there's already a dead man that's dying. But the sacrifice that Jesus makes allows us to live. And it allows us to live a life that's abundant and, and just full of miracles. Are you with me? This, this, is, this is what we what is part of our new covenant, right? We don't have to make sacrifices for sin and we don't have to make sacrifices for eternal life. Jesus has paid that price perfectly, comprehensively. You all got insurance on your cars? Some got, you know, just the coverage that just, if you hit somebody else, you get, you cover their car, but yours is still wrecked. But then some, there's like full coverage. Like Jesus paid it all. He paid it all so that we can be in a better covenant. We can be in one that is full of miracles. One that when, when it, it, the only thing that dies is the thing that God calls to die. But his intention for us is not to leave it dead, but to rise up again, to resurrect. Are you with me? We, 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 we're living sacrifices is what, is what the Bible says that we should be. We should be living sacrifices, which is just absolutely opposite of the sacrifice that we see in the Old Testament. It's totally opposite. And the Bible says that it's an, an acceptable, right, worship unto the Lord. That our living sacrifice is an acceptable worship unto the Lord. What's the name of our church? Come on now, we have a complete name. A name that is given under heaven for us overcomer covenant church and there's one thing that's so powerful about understanding about being in a covenant right that being in a covenant um, because when you're in covenant God is calling you to be all in right he's calling you to be all in like the whole body right your whole body is a living sacrifice but that's only asked of you because he's all in with you so he's asking you to be all in with him. Your whole body is acceptable worship. Does that, does that make sense? Right, right. It's about giving your whole body. It's about giving what you speak, what you listen to, what you watch, what you drink, what you put into your body. Right? It, it, it's, it's about all those things. It's about where you go. Right? And even more tonight, I'm talking about, it's about what you think, right? These are all living sacrifices. Uh, we're, we're in covenant with God, so we're all in. So this is, this is just easy for us. So sacrifice is just easy for us. We're all in. Regardless if you know it or not, you're all in. And you're all in because God's all in. There's some things that, you know, you hold on to a little bit, you know, tighter. But, um... You're all in. You're all in. Uh, we have several covenants in the Bible, right? And I'm not trying to get into every single one of them, but you have the covenant of Adam that came with a level of consequence. You have the covenant of Abraham that, that, um, or a covenant of Noah, right, that had to do with moral behavior. You had a covenant of um, Abraham, I'm trying to give it an order in a sense, right? Covered, covenant of Abraham uh, that came with circumcision or being set apart in generations, right? You have a, a Mosaic covenant um, that came with laws, right? 
um, we, we just have these different covenants, right? The covenant of David that always that promised that there will always be a son on the throne. There will always be a son, and Jesus fulfilled that. Is that right? But then there's the best covenant. There's the new covenant, right? This is a promise of, of sins being forgiven. This is a, a promise of eternal life. This is promise of a relationship with a fatherless world that all of a sudden has complete access to their heavenly daddy. And it all comes because of what Jesus did for us. He paid it all. So, like, why do I actually mention covenant, right? Because it's important that we understand what name we're under. If there's somebody that yells out, Herman Barnett, and Herman doesn't know his name, he may not get that check. He may not get that opportunity. No, come on, right? Because you got to know your name. You got to understand the, the, the aspects of your name. We are a church that's in covenant, Right, so that generationally, like why I'm sharing this is because it's important for us to understand that there's a level of sacrifice that's been made with who we are that allows us to create an atmosphere of miracles. How many were actually here when, when Pastor D and Pastor G prophesied and they declared that we are a house of miracles? So be it. So be it. We're a house of miracles because we're in covenant. We're in covenant. Exodus 34, 10, please. And the Lord responded, look, I am making a covenant. Right? In the presence of all your people, I will perform wonders. Some translation calls it, it says that's miracles. I'll perform miracles that have never been done in the whole earth or in any nation. All the people you live among will see the Lord's work. They'll see it. For what, am I, for what I am doing with you is all inspiring. Sacrifice creates that atmosphere for miracles. It, this is part of what God is doing with us since we're in covenant with him. It's always been the Lord's heart, right, for his people to be in covenant with him. It's always been his heart. It's always been his heart for, for us to experience, right? Paul says that, that these miracles and signs and wonders are, are actually to grow our faith. Is your faith being grown is my question. But not only for our faith to grow, but so that those that do not believe will believe. The miracle keeps growing. It's not just for you. It's not just for Pastor Roosevelt. It's so that he can grow in his faith, just like I'm growing in my faith. We're all growing in our faith. But there are other people that are attracted to this man, that are called to this man, that hear his voice. Because God is speaking through him that maybe at the moment don't believe. But because the miracle in his life, they will believe. This is what our Bible teaches us. Let me encourage you with this, because I know in my life it, it's been a little bit challenging, is that while I'm hoping for this big miracle, God starts with this little seed. Has he ever done that with you? Like while I'm working through this, and the Lord is telling me, don't despise. And what's crazy is that when I actually see the miracle come to pass in my life and other people's life around it, I don't even remember what the seed looked like. It's hard enough to even date back to when it planted. But how many know that he's faithful to water it in this season of our life? Supernaturally water it. The, the Bible says in Zechariah 4.10, it says, For who despises the day of small things? These seven eyes of the Lord, talking about his all-knowing and his perfect pers perspective, right, his understanding. It says that the seven eyes of the Lord, which scan throughout the whole earth, right, will rejoice when they see the ceremonial stone of Zerubbabel. Help me, Lord. 
with his hand, right? The Lord rejoices when the work begins. So let me encourage you with that. All you have to do is just begin a thing, right? We're too busy looking for the end of the miracle, but we don't understand that the Lord is rejoicing with his all-knowing and his perfect comprehensive perspective on the matter. He is already rejoicing when that first hand starts to lay the first stone. This is just even a reminder for me. Like in the context of the, of, of the Bible here, we're, we're talking about the, the first stone that actually the king was actually laying, right, to rebuild the temple, right, in Jerusalem after the exile of Babylon, right? And the Lord is looking at that first movement and he's rejoicing in it. Don't despise that, that small beginning, you want the ministry to grow. Don't despise the small beginning. You want that bank account to grow. With God, it's not always about how big that sacrifice is. Can I tell you that? Because there's, there's none that sacrifice like Jesus. It's not how big you think your giving is. Because there's nobody that gave greater than Jesus. Right? It's not how big you serve. Though that's good. But there's no one that served like Jesus. Like his word that is true says that I didn't come to serve, but I, I didn't come to be served. Yeah, 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 let me get it right. But to serve and give my life as that living sacrifice. I mean, Pastor G and D, they, they talk to us about it a lot, and, and we hear it in different ways and from different perspectives, and, and it's really about us being servants like Jesus. So um, what am I saying? I'm not saying don't, don't do it because you can't do it as big as Jesus. I'm saying do it because it makes you more like Jesus. And here's the thing about making and sacrificing for the midst of that, creating that environment where miracles when you don't have it, it's the perfect time to give it. When you don't have it, it's the perfect time to give it. I've seen businesses that my wife has sold turn, turnkey. Some of you have heard this testimony, but I'm going to throw it out there. Maybe somebody else grabs a hold of it. But I've seen businesses turn sold turnkey years and years and years later after they've been fruitful and fruitful and fruitful and fruitful in our lives based on sowing the seed in a time frame when we didn't have seed to sow. It was a sacrifice. Right? There were so many different trade-offs, but we've seen his faithfulness. So give if God's calling you to give. Serve if God is calling you to serve. Right? Don't despise the day of, of those small beginnings. Just get started. Start small if you have to. Just begin a thing. Right? Start sacrificing like Christ did. Are you with me? There's always going to be an exchange that happens in the midst of a sacrifice. That's the nature of it. You're giving up something that's, more, that's valuable for something that is probably even perceived as even more valuable. But if you're giving it up and it's not of value to you, I want to encourage you. I want to even challenge you to, to seek and go deeper with the Lord. Right? Because you might be setting something up as an idol in your life. And if, and if, I, if I can share this with you, and, and tonight I'm trying to testify just a little bit of even my life, is that there's many times where God has called me to give up a thing for his purposes that I've seen him produce that thing in my life again and again and again to the point where I'm like, Lord, you don't even have to do it again. Because here's the deal. It's not that big of a deal to me anymore. And I know if you put it on my heart, you can do it again and again and again. Like I've had so many situations in my life where God has called for that exchange or for me to sacrifice. But he's always been so faithful in my life. There's always a sacrifice. There's a story in 2 Kings 13, 20. 
and 21. You, got, you guys know this. This was Elijah. The Bible says that then Elijah died and was buried. Now, Moabite raiders used to come into the land in the spring um, of the year. I mean, they're coming into the land, right? These raiders are coming into the land when things are starting to bud and start, things are starting to become fruitful, right? You come out of this winter season and it's kind of dark. Things are covered. It's raining all the time. But then you come into the spring where things are starting to flourish. And this is when these band of raiders start coming through. I think it's amazing because it says once, as the Israelites were burying a man. So these guys are about it, right? They're taking care of their people. They're, they're burying a man. Suddenly they saw a raiding party. So they threw the man into Elijah's tomb. Like if you, if you do the research on here, if you do, you do the study, you recognize that this was above ground. It wasn't like... You know, he threw him into something fancy. Like these guys actually saw some raiders and they decided to throw the body into the tomb of Elijah and get running. Right? But the Bible says that when he touched Elijah's bones, the man revived and he stood up. I don't think he was running though. But he stood up. So Elijah dies. Let me get this right. Elijah dies. He's in the grave. The Israelites are burying another man, right? And they see the enemy coming, and they decide to throw the man's dead body onto the bones into the tomb of Elijah so that they can take off and get away from these raiders. And the prophet Elijah's life The sacrifice brings life. The prophet of God's life that is no longer in his body is the very thing that brings life to this man. I mean, are we talking about miracles or what? I mean, it's the same, the same way Jesus laid down his life. To give us life. Right? We should lay our lives down as that living sacrifice. Like I want, like I always wonder, like, you know, Abraham dies and you're like, hey, take my bones. I'm like, man, take your bones. Like it's got me to the point where like, hey, take my bones. Because, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for a life that is full of signs and wonders, that's full of miracles. Father, that has changed many lives around this Pacific Northwest and even so much beyond that my bones, that your bones, if someone accidentally just kicked the body onto your bones, that they would resurrect. Right? Resurrection means what? Get back up. Our lives should be in such a place that even on our worst day, Somebody even gets close to you, Brandon. Their life gets back up. They experience resurrection. The one that didn't believe now believes. Talk about miracles. Hmm. What do you need stood back up in your life? Because we, we're in a house of miracles. There's nothing too hard for God. Like we believe in the Lord. We have faith in God. We have the faith of God that is growing in us day by day, hour by hour, breath by breath. What do you need stood up in your life? If he could do it with dead bones, like we're in a time of miracles. We're definitely in a time of miracles. And why I'm sharing this is because I don't want us to strap our minds into a particular perspective on how that miracle could come about. Here's the thing. Those guys, the Israelites that were burying the body, they weren't looking for resurrection. They already mourned this man. They already said their peace. Now they were burying him and trying to move on with life. Sometimes that's just the way it works with miracles. So the thing that you need stood up, the thing that you call dead, the promise that you haven't found fulfilled, like I mentioned to you in the beginning, is that I've been experiencing those things. And I've been seeing the Lord just move what he needs to move. 
engage and connect what he needs to engage and connect. I've even had people praying for stuff that they didn't even really know that they should pray for. But we've seen the faithfulness of God to stand that thing back up. And it's better than we can ever imagine. Come on, the dead wake up. But it's sacrifice. It, it takes a little bit of sacrifice. He left what he knew. This I'm talking about Elijah, right? You know the story of Elijah following Elijah. He left what he knew. This is, he's from a successful family, right? But he goes back and he celebrates and he, man, he kills the oxen. He cooks the oxen with the actual equipment. He burns the equipment up, cooks the oxen. Like he gets rid of everything. Just to give context on why his bones still reek of an anointed sacrifice. Because he left everything so that he can possess in his life everything that still produces, even in the midst of a grave. I mean, that's just powerful. They're like, But this is our sacrifice, right? Our time, our money, our ambition, right? Possessions, our sexuality, right? These are, these are all parts of our sacrifice. Tonight, I'm talking specifically more about our mouth, like what we speak, our ears, what's influencing us, our mind, how are we thinking about things, right? And our attitudes, our emotions. I'm, like this is, that, this is the focus. So like I would love for you to be able to hear it from that context. This will pivot into that kind of context for me that one of the things is the sacrifice of our mouth, right? We know that the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those that love it, they'll eat its fruit. Trees can produce good fruit and bad fruit, right? There's some stuff that you don't want to eat because it's poison or at least make you sick. But then there's stuff that you want to eat and you just keep eating and eating and eating and eating. That should be how our words are. There should be things that want to be eaten. They want to be consumed because they bring life, not death. It's challenging in the culture that we live in today, too. Because there's just so much fear running around and there's so much negative opinion running around. And there's so many people talking about what they don't even know. And the best thing they can do is come from a perspective of it being negative, it being bad, being fearful. But I think the Lord is calling us to speak life. So we have to be able to sacrifice some of those things and sacrifice what comes out of our mouth. In Acts 3, 3 um, in Acts 3, 1 through 10, and I won't read it all, but we'll get close because we're reading the Bible tonight. Um, Peter and John encountered the lame, at, lame man at the gate called Beautiful. Right? This shouldn't be a new story. But the Bible says that now Peter and John, see, these apostles were going up to the temple for a time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. A man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful so that he could beg from those entering the temple. That was his purpose. That's what man set him up to do. It set him there in a disability so that he can beg from those that were entering the temple. When, when he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. Right? Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, look at us. Now, 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 I want you to put yourself in that perspective when you're driving in your nice little fancy car and you're sitting at that HO in that you're sitting at that light getting onto the freeway and there's somebody that's sitting off to the side. Are you looking them straight in the face? Come on, like, I, man, I throw no stones, right? It shouldn't be for us. But we see the apostles, they look him straight in his face, straighten his face and said, look at us, look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Get up and walk. Now, if I jump to nine, please. It says all the people saw him walking and praising God. And here's the kicker. They recognized that he was, this past tense, 
He was the one who used to sit and beg at the, at the beautiful gate of the temple. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what hap- happened to him, what had happened to him. So though they didn't, they didn't have silver and gold, they, they actually just gave what they did have, right? They, they spoke life instead of cursing. Or How many times have we encountered a situation where there's somebody that's begging or somebody that has a sign and, and a clever one at that? And the first thing is like, hey, I don't, I don't know what you're going to do with my money. I'm going to work. Or I'm coming from work. Or I barely have enough this, this month. I'm not going to give you money so you can buy drugs. Or you can, right, how many, have we done that? I mean, like that is, that's been our perspective. But Peter and John, what they did is they provisioned him with, the, with words of life. No, no, I'm not saying that's just the only answer. No, that's not what I'm saying. Like the Lord has even convicted, with, convicted me. Like, hey, you carry a wallet every day. Why don't you have any cash? You're not going to cash out that guy. You're not going to Venmo him. Right? No, 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 no. This is real. So the Lord's saying put cash in your wallet. Right, because who am I to pull up to somebody in my own neighborhood and that I almost see every single day and just say, hey, have a good day, or the Lord loves you while he's shivering and I'm in a warm vehicle? No, 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 I'm just being simple, right? But we're trying to create a culture and an atmosphere of miracles in our city, in our households, in, our, in this nation. Lord, help us. But it, see, it requires just a level of disobedience to what God is saying. But one thing that's powerful about this, and you'll see this as some of the model when God is actually operating in things and creating miracles, that they keep going, right? The Bible says that miraculous, miraculously it happens. This man is actually healed, right? He's leaping up and praising God. He goes into the temple, right? But, but like, it's not just that, and I don't mean to trivialize it, because that's huge, but it's not just that. It, it says that, like, it, you literally look at it, and the miracle starts to follow the apostles, right? Because now everybody is looking at this miracle, and they're just like, they're, oh, wow. Like, they want to know what's going on. They're, 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 they're grabbed by this miracle of God. And what does Peter do? He <laughs> preaches the gospel, the, which is the greatest miracle that we can experience. He uses that opportunity to actually preach the gospel. And you can just imagine how many lives are saved, how many people come into I mean, And it started with, listen, man, like silver and gold, like I don't even have that, right? I'm just coming to a place to pray. I've seen you daily. But he speaks life. And then the Lord sets up the rest. And it makes way for the gospel to be preached, lives to be saved, people to be healed. Right? The, that miracle just keeps going and going and going. But this is the, the character of an atmosphere that is being created of miracles. So it's not just that one miracle that comes to pass. That thing starts to produce after itself. And everything that's needed because it's what God intended will produce. Let's talk about sacrifice of mindsets and attitudes. Right? I'm really just trying to focus in on the mind, right? Or, you know, our thoughts and our perspectives, right? Because a lot of times, like I was sharing with you different things, it's our soul, right? It's our, that gets in the way. Right? So, like, if we can break through that, psh, like, we'll really be limitless, right? Like, there will be no stop. There will be no stop. Like, we'll be able to grasp the impossible things that God say are possible. So that, that's where I'm focusing. John 5 talks about the man at the pool of Bethesda, right? For the sake of time, I'm not going to read through the whole scripture, but this is an account of a man that's actually lying at, the, at a pool of Bethesda that gets stirred up by an angel every so often. 
And this man has been lame for 38 plus years. He's literally laying there, lame, for 38 plus years. And of all days, Jesus walks by. And the only thing that really just comes out of Jesus' mouth is, do you want to be well? Do you want to get well? And the lame man, he just brings excuses. You ever done that? Whether it be an answer right in front of you, if it be that promotion, but you just have every excuse in the world why you're not qualified for it. Or someone speaks a word over your life and, 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 and you've been chosen and you've been called, but still inside you still don't know if you have what it takes to actually be that woman of God or that man of God. I haven't experienced enough tragedy in my life. I haven't suffered enough to be valuable when God is saying, this is your call. This is what I'm calling you to. Excuse after excuse after excuse. And some of them are real good. Some are real good. And some of them hold weight. They ground you for years and years and years and years and years. This is this, is this man. He has worked up a story and a narrative in his mind that he's just going to be lame forever. But then Jesus walks into his life and says, hey, do you want to get well? And he just gives them excuse after excuse. But then Jesus says, he, do, he, doesn't even, he doesn't even go with it. He says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk, and just walk. And the Bible says that instantly the man got well and started walking. That, that lame man, if you can't see it, but that lame man had to sacrifice his mental. He had to sacrifice how he thought about a thing. Like this is how powerful it is when Jesus walks into an environment, right? When he walks into an environment, shows up with who he is and even so much of who he is in us and speaks a word, things just start to shift. Things just start to change. But a lot of what is happening is, is he's changing our mindset about a thing, this is what happens with this guy. Jesus didn't ask him why he was lame, how long he was lame, when the angel was going to come stir up the pool, who got in front of him, who got behind him, who got on the side of him. He, he didn't ask any of that. He just said, do you want to be well? Requires you to think about it. Answer should be yes. And he says, okay. The Lord is here. I've spoken a thing. Get your mat up and walk. But there was a sacrifice of his mentality that he had to have. He had to change his mind about some things. And I think in part of our sacrifice and us being a house of miracles, there's things that we need to change our mind about. We got to be believing God for even greater. I mean, we have faith in God. But how about we have faith like God? You are created in his image and likeness. It's hard to please God without faith. So he can be liberal. Father, we give you permission to pour out liberal tons of faith. So that's the same thing for you. When you, when you have Christ in you and you have the faith of God, you walk into an environment, there is nothing that you can't shift. Pastor G always talks about going in and commanding. You command because God has given you an authority and he's given you an, a power. But do you understand that? It's not there to just discern whatever you want to discern and place judgment on whatever we want to judge and, and, and have a better clue we think of what is going on in the world. How about it is that we speak a thing based on we're thinking about things differently and God gives us this great insight and he gives us the strategic mind and he gives us a wisdom that is actually usable in our households, in our cities, in our workplaces, in our, in our schools. But it's going to require us a sacrifice of how we think about things. Does that make sense? The, the last one, and we'll close with this one, is... This is for the intercessors. If, if you're an intercessor, raise your hand. Come on. Come on, I know your hand is tired, but get your hand up there. 
Because if you're a person in here that prays, my hope and prayer for you is that your prayer is not stuck on yourself but that you intercede for others, even if you don't know what it is. And here's the deal. If you're not there and you're not moving in that capacity, raise your hands anyway, because that's what God has called you to do. I mean, shamelessly, like Pastor Roosevelt is sitting up front. He leads our prayer ministry. There's always a need, not just here, but throughout this earth for people that will pray and intercede, that will sacrifice their time and sacrifice their resource, their spiritual resource. There's something powerful about taking the time on your face, not to just ask God for what you need, but what somebody else might need. Like we, we came out of this time of prayer and fasting, so like that should just be part of our rhythm. That should just be part of our motion, right? That we just start to intercede. Because there's many of you that are here today that have been called to stand on the wall and watch. But your responsibility is not just watching from that angle. It's praying and it's seeking God for his will and his way in this earth. It's a privilege. But it takes sacrifice. It takes sacrifice. I can't get out of this unless I talk about something in Acts because it just really grounds us in something that if you have a hard time believing this read Acts this is a season where you should spend some time in Acts and just really see some of the things that God did with his people and see some of the things that God did with the apostles and and his the believers and different followers of Christ because there's something powerful about having the living God dwell in you it's something that, that a lot of the Old Testament didn't get, get a chance to experience, but we talk about so many miracles that happened in that, in, in that season. But there's a reality that the Lord is calling us to walk in. And, and so in Acts 12, I pick up in 6, it says, When Herod was about to bring him out for trial, that very night Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. So this is like both, James, both Peter and James were arrested, right? This is the kind of season that they were living in. They, they, they were arrested for being who they are, but for following Jesus, speaking, speaking the good news of the gospel. They were arrested, and James is actually killed. He's actually executed. And, and, and King Herod actually looks at the response of the Jews and he looks at the response of the people and says, like, yeah, this is good for ratings, baby. You see how they reacted and they responded to me killing James? Peter's next. That was his plan. He's guilty. Peter's next. And the Bible says, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared. And a light shone in the cell, striking Peter on the side. He's going to wake up. The angel's waking him up. And he says, get quick, get up. Do do you see a, a theme here? There's a lot of getting up. There's tons of getting up. You should get you some get up. <laughs> get up. And he said the chains fell off his wrists. This guy's being guarded by 16 soldiers. And the chains fell off his wrist. Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. Like some of us, we really need to just get dressed. We really need to put on the sandals. The places that God is calling you to walk and go, you need tough feet. You need tough feet to carry the gospel. You got to get up, you got to get dressed. You can't sleep in. You can't be lullabied. You can't get lethargic. It's a time for us to wake up. Get up. Peter, I know you're in bondage. I know you're strapped. I know you're accused. I know you're in prison. But here's the deal. Get up. Get your clothes on. Get your shoes on. (laughs) And he did. He said, wrap your cloak around you. There's a lot of us that have cloaks, but we laid them down. Call it whatever you want. 
pandemic, I don't know, COVID. Call it whatever you like. But there's many of you that have mantles that you lay down. And the Lord is saying, pick those things back up. It might not seem like there's the mantle there, but the Lord is saying, pick it up. Where is yours? Everything externally doesn't speak to the power and the authority that comes with that mantle, but it's that mantle that changes the game. I want double portion. I want great like you have. I want even greater, Elijah. Come on, hang in there. Walk with me. If you're around, when the Lord takes me up, there's going to be something that drops. And he was around. He picked it up, put it on. There became a major shift of it wasn't Elijah's God. It became Elijah's God. Pick up the mantle, that's what he's telling you. Wrap yourself in it, get close. And he told him, follow me. Mm, that's, that's good enough right there. So, so he went out and he followed and he did not know that what the angel did was really happening. But he thought he was seeing a vision. Like this, this angel started moving and started bidding and doing the command of God on Peter's behalf. While Peter's just locked up. He's guarded. It didn't say that he was praising and that he was worshiping. And I'm not saying that he wasn't doing those things, right? But, but I am saying it's to the point where Peter is moving through this, Brandon, but he doesn't even understand, like, what is going on? Am I delusional? Is this real? He actually thinks that he's seeing a vision. Not only is he seeing the vision, he's in the midst of the vision. Like, how crazy is that? Angel starts moving around, starts doing the bidding. And the apostle Paul is like, man, he's just not sure what's going on. But then it says that when Peter came to himself, this is in verse 11. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grass. This was Peter's miracle. This was, do you know apostles pray for miracles for themselves? even as much as they pray for us and they pray for the body that they're called to, the people that they're called to, they need miracles too. So I'm not saying this, right? Pray for the apostle of the house. Pray for our pastors. Pray for Pastor G and Pastor D. You never know what situation they're in. Right? But, but we see something powerful here that as soon as Peter actually realized this is a real deal, this is actually happening, guys, he goes to Mary's house, right? And there's a prayer meeting happening. They were creating an atmosphere of miracles. Like he goes and he knocks on the door. And this young servant, Rhoda, she comes to the door and she's so excited because she's actually hearing. Like, I recognize Peter's voice, but like we're sitting there praying that he'd be released from prison. And he's telling the others, right? And we can get here sometimes is that we'll be in the midst of prayer and we'll be seeking God and believing God. And the answer just shows right up. The miracle just shows right up. And we're like, girl, you see, you seeing an angel. We go to the point where we're saying, you seeing an angel, not an actual physical person that you know. You're seeing an angel. You must be out of your mind. You got, it's too much screen time for you. You're not seeing right. And Peter just keeps, keeps knocking. He just keeps knocking. And finally, they open the door, and, and the place just goes berserk. Because what they've been praying for, they're actually seeing. I'm getting ready to see, right? They're seeing something they've never seen. They unlock a miracle for Peter. And, and, and when he was claimed guilty, the Lord says, nope, not guilty. When he was in prison, the Lord says, nope, free. And it just came from a group of people that gathered around a thing. I don't know how close they were, how close they lived. 
But they had to sacrifice their time. To wake up at four in the morning. Wake up at five because that's my shift. Somebody else is going to take six and seven and eight. And the prayer of God's saints are going to continue to go up. Because we don't, we don't have a brass ceiling over us. And our lives don't reflect earths that are covered with iron, that are not fruitful and productive. That's not the God we serve. It's not the access we have. That's limited. We have unlimited access to an unlimited God that's more than willing and capable of doing what we see to what we think is impossible. Mm. There's importance in interceding. If we're going to continue to travel this road of, of miracles together, we, we have to be people that are willing to intercede. Right? We started some of that. Okay, you're going to be praying when, when you normally are eating. And it's good. Follow that motion. Create that rhythm. If you don't operate out of a calendar in life, maybe find a calendar so you can at least see how much time you actually do have available or how you're using that time. Ask the Lord to shift your prayer life. Get off of what you need because he's, he's faithful. He's not going to give you a stone. He's not going to give you a snake. He desires to, a snake. He desires to give you good things. So why don't we just receive those good things and put some energy and some time and, and, and seek the throne and, and war for somebody else because that's what's going to create this atmosphere of miracles. Listen, I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to continue my race and continue to walk out my faith walk with the Lord. But I know that I got to do some things differently. I got to do some things differently. I got to invest in places that I haven't invested before. And I'm talking about money. Come on, like that's, I mean, that's, that's the lowest in the kingdom, like not even in the kingdom of God. That's not our currency. Right? So that's not what I'm talking about. But he's been faithful in those things. So I'm, I'm challenging us and I'm encouraging us. The Bible says that when there's two or three that are gathered, Father is right in the midst of that. So let us gather. Let us make those sacrifices. Because we're in a house of miracles. Man, like I can go, but like we're, we're at quarter till... You know, every, every miracle that you've, you see in the Old Testament and every miracle that you see in the New Testament, there's just common things in there. There's always sacrifice and there's always prayer. And, and, and we have to be a house that prays. We have to be a people that prays, right? We have to be ones that sacrifice. Our pastors encourage us. They challenge us weekly, right? Give. And then not so we can just have bigger buildings, right? Or, and no, nah, that's not what we're talking about, right? Expansion is just inevitable. It's going to happen because this is what happens in the kingdom. But there's many things that we sow into. There's many people that we help. I mean, we have men going back to Uganda to help continue to grow a program that we've had thousands, it seems like, of men here, here in the Pacific Northwest go through called the return. I mean, that started small late last year. But what God has shown us, and more importantly, what God has shown that nation and the men of God that are on watch, and it is their time. Jeez, can you imagine? All those men set on fire for God. All those men experiencing freedom like they never have. And then there'll be the well that'll probably go there. Like, I'm, I'm, I don't know any plans. Like, don't listen to me. But what if? But that requires us to give. That requires us to serve. And I'm telling you, that flight was not fun. Most of us were broken up by the time we got there, let alone while we were there and praying to come back home. But, but what God did, he was, he was reckless with us. Reckless and just full of miracles. 
and we got to serve, right? Because that's what God has called us to do. The, the, there's all these things that have to be in partnership, and that's the key word, partnership, if we're going to be a house of miracles. Because the Lord is going to use you. He's going to use us to bring those miracles, to pray those miracles through. But more importantly, he's going to call us to sacrifice for those miracles. But he's faithful, amen? Therefore, brothers and sisters, in the view of the mercies of God, I urge you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. It's our time, church. It's our time. Amen? Come on, it's our time. We're going to sacrifice our whole life for our whole life. This is just who we are. It's who God called us to be. Who God called you to be. And we're going to see miracles. Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your love for us. I thank you for your spirit that, that dwells within us and empowers us to walk like Jesus, to speak like Jesus, captivate our minds so we think like Jesus. Father, convict our hearts, Lord, for for your concerns. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are a God of miracles and that we're your children. So as you've called us to be like you and you've made us in your image and your likeness, Father, we, we say yes to the sacrifice that you require. We say yes to being the vessels, Father, that you would use to bring miracles about. Father, let there be great leaping and and praising and joy as miracles pour out at each and every person in this place and, and those that are online and those that are even under, under this word at the moment or even in the future. Let there be great joy and praising that comes from the great miracles that you do in their lives. Father, we submit ourselves to you. And strip what you need to strip. But, Father, we say yes to putting back on our shoes. We say yes to getting back up. And we say yes to putting on the mantle that you have called us to wear. Father, teach us your ways, for your ways are so much better. We'll give you glory, God. We'll give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.